Yeah, let's start talking about definitions now. Uh, and the all sum rule is a very good, what we need is good checks for quality of definitions, and that's what I'm going to try and formulate now. Definitions in the ontology context are about necessary and sufficient conditions. So if you're writing a dictionary, definition writing has to do with capturing meanings to help users of the, of the dictionary. And there you don't care about circularity, you don't care about conciseness, you don't care about the definitions forming a coherent whole, you just care about one definition being a good definition to help someone reading it understand the meaning of one word. And it could be the dif dictionary only defines one word, it would still be a good dictionary if it achieves that end. But when we're dealing with ontologies, all the definitions have to fit together. And then we need to understand that the definition provides a set of conditions which are individually necessary and jointly sufficient. And to see an example, uh, the, this is a set of, de of conditions for being a triangle which are individually necessary, and you can check that very easily. That means checking that every one of these things holds at every triangle. And then jointly sufficient, and to check that, what you need to do is to check that nothing satisfies all of these five conditions, which is not a triangle. So they are sufficient to give you the answer triangle in every single case. Now, the first rule about definitions is that they should not be circular. So th this is an example of a circular definition. And it's circular because it repeats the word that it's defining in the very definition, which means it can help nobody. And it's almost certainly actually going to harm computers. Now, the second rule, which is a rule of thumb in the sense that you shouldn't u think you can use it everywhere, but you should try and use it everywhere aggressively. This is the idea of Aristotelian definitions. And I'll just show you the example. So to formulate an Aristotelian definition, you, you find the parent term in your ontology, and then you try and find the specific difference. That is to say, what makes instances of the term you're trying to define differ from all the other instances of the parent term? And what makes human beings, as we all know, differ from all the other animals is that human beings are rational. I'm not saying this is necessarily a good definition. I'm saying it's an illustration of this principle. The form of a definition is an instance of the species is an instance of the genus which has this particular differentiating condition. This idea was put forward in what is still a classic of biomedical informatics, which sets forth the principles underlying the foundational model of anatomy. And I recommend that you read this piece. It truly is a wonderful piece. When I started working on biomedical ontology, this was the first piece I read which I was impressed with. If you have a definition following that rule, you already know the parent, what the parent term should be in the ontology and vice versa. This rule also does a lot to prevent circularity because it forces you to think at a higher level and then to come back down again and to think about how these things are differentiated rather than just to think about the term which you started with, which will tend to lead you in the direction of circularity. So examples from the FMA. The FMA is the foundational model of anatomy ontology. It's a gigantic ontology of anatomy. So a cell in the FMA has as its parent term anatomical structure, and every cell consists of cytoplasm surrounded by a plasma membrane. So everything which is an anatomical structure consisting of cytoplasm surrounded by a plasma membrane is a cell, and every cell is that. And it, then he defines plasma membrane as a cell part that surrounds the cytoplasm. I'm using this example to show you how hard you have to work to get a good system of definitions, because it, this is not enough. You have now to define cell part, check that there is no circularity, and if there is circularity, you need to think of another way of defining plasma membrane. And one way would be to define it as a part of an anatomical structure that surrounds the cytoplasm. And this, this is the main point I want to emphasize about writing definitions, that you have to think through. It's like a, a game of chess, where you have to think through three or four or five moves ahead 
in order to check that your definition is going to be a good definition. And if you do that, the rewards will be tremendous, because then your ontology will work. Now, this, all, all of this works well for common nouns and common nouns phrases of the sort that you use in science, like plasma membrane or cell. It doesn't work so well for relations, so has membrane part, which is a, a relation that we introduced for other purposes, can be defined as a kind of Aristotelian specification of has part. Namely, has membrane part is a kind of has part which involves an instance of membrane as the part term. It, it's less elegant and also less generalizable. It's, it's not a, a recipe that works easily in the way that the recipe works, at least to get you started when we're dealing with nouns and noun phrases. And you can see the summary of all of this here. I already said you can't keep on defining uh, forever, that, so there have to be root nodes which are primitives, or they have to be very general nodes at the top of every ontology which are primitive. Some of these might be defined in terms of terms from other ontologies at an even higher level, but that process has to stop at some stage, and BFO is where it stops. So BFO is the top level ontology which defines some terms, but which leaves the absolutely undefinable terms as being primitive. And Every definition in every ontology should, if, if we unpacked it, should land in some BFO expression. Now, the reason why, why definitions come to an end, definitions work only if they use terms which are simpler, logically more intelligible than the term defined. Otherwise, they don't help. Gradually, you're getting down to simpler and simpler terms like object or process or quality, and that's what BFO is for. All right, now... We've already raised this issue in connection with multiple inheritance. When we come to define something, if we, it's not already in our ontology, we may not know what the appropriate parent term is. And we want to use the definitional process to help us define which parent term to use in writing a definition of a term. So let's suppose we are creating an automobile ontology, and someone says, well, we need the term blue car in our ontology. And the correct response is to say, don't be an idiot. But if he is our boss, then we have three choices. One choice is to say, well, a blue car is clearly a blue thing. Another choice is to say that a blue car is a car, which, of course, is the correct choice, uh, but although even then, not quite. Or a third choice is to say, well, we need both, and then you have multiple inheritances. But then which should we choose? Neither of those is actually very good. The, the correct answer is we shouldn't have a blue car in our ontology. We should have two ontologies. One ontology for the colors that we use, which will vary if, uh, with the development of paint science, and another ontology, which is an ontology of the vehicles we build. And then we can swap colors around ad lib as we swap vehicles around, and everything will be single inheritance. So these are reference ontologies. They are asserted ontologies. Blue car is a defined class. There is no universal blue car, but we can talk as if there were a universal blue car because we can formulate the definition of a blue car. A blue car is a car which is blue. That's not an extra universal. As is proved by the fact you might repaint it. So unpacking is what I was talking about earlier. If you have a well-formulated ontology, you should be able to take every term in the ontology and unpack its definition so you get a longer definition, and then unpack all the terms in that definition so you get an even longer definition. And eventually you would get a completely unpacked definition, which should still make sense. It should still be correct English or correct OWL, whichever way you do it. And then you should be able to substitute that definition in any sentence in which the original term occurs and get, still get a, a sentence which has the same truth value. We saw the FMA example. We should be able to substitute the term plasma membrane with the definition and still get a correct definition. So here we have eliminated plasma membrane and we still have a correct definition. You can rely on that being possible for all the terms in the FMA which are defined. Uh, so substitution. If a definition is correct, then we can substitute the definition for the term defined in all contexts and preserve truth. Now that's not quite true. What we mean is in all transparent contexts, 
So it could be that somebody understands the term but doesn't understand the definition. That, that's not a transparent context, that's an opaque context, which means it involves knowledge or belief. So John knows that a leukocyte is an animal cell, but he does not know that an achromatic cell of the myeloid or lymphoid lineage is capable of amoeboid movement is an animal cell. Definitions should be concise, so uh, we, we can see uh, this problem here. So this is the National Cancer Institute thesaurus definition of tuberculosis. What they really meant to say is that. That's the properly definitional part. The rest is just chatter. So it's not part of the definition to know that 90 to 95 percent of primary TB infections may go unrecognized. That is just chatter. To be concise, you shouldn't have any definitions as proper parts. You should reuse the terms which have already been defined to save space and thereby to increase readability, both by humans and by computers. You shouldn't build in superfluous explanations or journalistic stories or encyclopedic knowledge. You should just define what is logically needed to specify the jointly sufficient and individually necessary conditions for being an instance of that thing. No examples, um, no ellipses, no usually or in general. It has to be necessary and sufficient conditions rather than what typically is the case. All right, so I'm going to repeat now some uh, design principles put forward by a colleague of ours here in Buffalo until recently who has been working on this topic quite single-mindedly. These are some examples of good and bad definitions. This gives you a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for being a mammal. This gives you a list of things which are mammals and says that mammals are things like this. Um, and this gives you a, a, a necessary condition but not a list of sufficient conditions. Avoid conjunctions. So in, the, in SNOMED, at least for a time, they like to have conjunctive genera. So a cell culture system is a systems and reagents. And that's just not English. That's the NCI thesaurus. Uh, or they had disjunctions. An analyte is a substance or chemical constituent. And I, I doubt that they gave us definitions of substances and chemical constituents so that we would know what that meant. Here we have what is called the use mention confusion. The use mention confusion, again, it's something that the gene ontology used to uh, be guilty of and still some ontologies uh, uh, make this mistake. So when I use the word mouse, I'm saying things like all the mouse in my, mice in my collection are friendly. When I mention the, use, the word mouse, I'm saying the word mouse has five letters. And the use mentioned con confusion is to say things like swimming is healthy and has seven letters. So you're confusing using a word with mentioning it. This definition, a mammal is a representation of an animal that and so on, confuses a mammal with some word or some other way of representing a mammal. And similarly, if I say mammal is a term that refers to an animal, then I'm making the use mentioned confusion. Then the correct way avoids the use mentioned confusion to define a mammal as a vertebrate that has head, gives live birth, and nurses its young. Now, avoid non-defining information. We've seen that already with TB and the NCI thesaurus. So myo, a myeloablative agonist is used to prepare patients. We don't need to know that for the definition. It's, it's irrelevant extra data. All we need to know is the necessary and sufficient conditions. And then definition shouldn't be too broad. So if we define a bird as an animal that lays eggs, then we miss out fish, which also lay eggs. And it shouldn't be too narrow. Um, so Werner already mentioned the um, definition of water as a nursing substance which contains molecules of H2O or something. Avoid circularity. So beauty is the state of being beautiful. And beautiful is defined as full of